Hi everyone, this is Professor Cooper. I'm gonna talk about fatigue failure theories as an intro video. So this will be a great refresher for 328. And if you haven't seen this, this material in 328, this is a great place to start uh, to kind of get caught up for 329. All right, so we'll start with a little bit of a history lesson. Um, so what is fatigue failure? It's basically the failure that occurs from stresses that vary with time or that fluctuate between different levels. And this failure phenomenon was first noticed in the 1800s when railroad car axles began failing after even just a short time in service. And this was a mystery because these axles had been designed with the most advanced engineering expertise at the time, but it was the 1800s, so our knowledge was pretty much based on static loading scenarios. So static load would be um, one that induces a stress that doesn't vary with time or fluctuate between different levels. So another interesting observation was made about the way these axles were failing. They were failing, they were kind of behaving like brittle materials when they failed, meaning that they exhibited sudden brittle-like fractures, even though the axles were made out of ductile material. So people began studying these failing axles and noticed that because of the way the axles were fixed to the wheels, they rotated with the wheel. Hence, the axles were undergoing what we call cyclic loading. And we're going to look at what we call fully reverse loading, which is a type of cyclic loading on, um, in more detail in the next slide. But this just simply hadn't been studied yet because dynamic loads were pretty much a new phenomenon that came about with the introduction of steam-powered machinery. All right, so let's picture a rotating shaft subject to a force. Got to be held in place by something, so it has some bearings. This looks pretty familiar to all of those simply supported beams that you've been studying the past couple of years. So in a static loading situation, we draw this pretty exaggerated. You would have compression on top and tension in the bottom fibers. The difference in fatigue loading is that the shaft is rotating. So a point that was initially in tension, once that shaft rotates 180 degrees, that point is now in compression. And the point that was initially in compression is now in tension. So that's why um, we see these sinusoidal waves to describe at least for here, this is fully, re fully reverse loading, meaning that the magnitude of the, you know this formula, probably one you should get tattooed on your forearm, in case you forget, um, sigma equals mc over i. So that is our bending stress formula. And it has equal magnitude because we're fully reversing the load, but it's just fluctuating between tension compression, tension compression. There are other types of cyclic loading. So you can have a, kind of like a mid-range load induced and have a sinusoidal wave off of that mid-range value, but we'll talk about that more later. Fully reverse is the simplest case, and it's where all of the SN diagrams and a lot of the equations that we use to study fatigue are, um, are developed. So it's like our baseline case. Okay, go back to the history lesson. Even in 1839, the mechanism of fatigue was still not understood, but lots of observations were made to confirm that ductile materials subjected to fluctuating loads were really prone to these brittle-like failures. And it was kind of talked about as though the material had become embrittled or tired, which is actually where the term fatigue came about. But interestingly, the broken halves of components that had failed in fatigue still retained their yield strength and their ductility. So it wasn't like fatigue loading was inherently changing the material's properties, but it was obviously affecting the failure mechanism. So a man named August Roller, I think I'm saying that right, a German engineer began testing axles to failure in a systematic way. And he discovered a really interesting relationship between the number of loading cycles and an axle strength. Simply put, the strength of the axles diminished as a function of the number of loading cycles. And that is depicted in what we call this SN curve. 
So fatigue strength. as a function of the number of cycles. So as cycles go up, the material's strength essentially goes down. But this diminishing strength levels off at a certain point, which we call the fatigue limit. It's also called the endurance limit. And this sort of magic point, it's not really a point, but around 1 million cycles is when at least steels, for example, exhibit what we call infinite strength, meaning that a steel component can withstand an infinite amount of cycles beyond one million without its strength diminishing. There's some caveats to that. For example, if you have, um, if something's always subjected to rust or corrosion, you're never gonna have an endurance limit. But again, we'll get to that later. So this is pretty interesting and it kind of explains um, why the axles had been failing after a short time in service, because it really doesn't take too long to get up to a million cycles, especially with you know, continual loading. Even though the axles had been designed according to the material static yield strength, which is significantly above the fatigue strength. Okay, so fatigue is a big deal. It's a really important topic for engineers. And most failures in machinery are due to, to fatigue failures, to so these time varying loads. So uh, kind of an older statistic, it was the best one I could find. The annual cost of fatigue of materials to the US economy in 1892, which was before you were all born, I think, um, was about $100 billion, so about 3% of the GMP. And fatigue loading is prevalent, it's everywhere. It's way more common to find fatigue loading, or cyclic loading rather than static loading. So vehicles and aircrafts of all types, bridges, cranes, power plant equipment, offshore oil well structures, miscellaneous machinery and equipment, anything that's used on like a production line is obviously gonna be rotating. Um, I did not take this picture, but one of the first internships I did was at the National Wind Technology Center in Colorado. And it was really cool to see these huge wind turbine blades with weights attached and the weights would be put on there and they'd make it fluctuate. It was really noisy, but they're literally, you know, testing these blades to fatigue failure. So I have a video. 1954 and one of the world's first jet airliners takes off from Italy. The plane is the ultimate in high speed luxury travel. But just 26 minutes into the flight, it explodes catastrophically. 35 people are dead. The tragedy stuns a nation. A team of investigators must solve the mystery of why this state-of-the-art aircraft disintegrated on a routine flight. What they discover in the wreckage will cause a turning point in the history of aviation and change passenger travel forever. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down to those final seconds from disaster. Ten thirty one AM, January tenth, nineteen fifty four. Twenty six minutes to disaster. Flight seven eight one takes off from Rome Airport. The plane is designed with an exceptionally thin aluminium skin. Rivets punched into the aircraft during construction create microscopic manufacturing defects. On each flight, the pressurization system puts enormous strain on the fuselage, causing stress to the skin, especially around the windows and doors. Repeated pressurizations turn the manufacturing defects into fatigue cracks that get bigger with every flight. 19 minutes to disaster. Flight 781 climbs to 11,000 meters. As it ascends, the pressure increases and the aircraft's skin becomes more stressed. Would you like some tea, At 10.51 a.m., 
The Comet's pilot, Captain Gibson, sends a radio message. George Hamjik from George York, Peter. Five seconds to disaster. A fatigue crack reaches two centimeters in length, and the aircraft's skin rips apart. At 10.57 a.m., the shattered pieces of Flight 781 fall from the sky. 35 people are dead. All right, so when I show that video in 328, I pause and kind of use it as an opportunity to talk about our and your ethical responsibility for learning critical engineering concepts. And fatigue, I believe, is a really critical concept. I mean, anything that causes catastrophic failure, so the same could be said about column buckling, but as we talked about, fatigue loading is so prevalent in you know, everyday life, and it really is our responsible to understand it well. So, um, you know, learn it well. Don't just kind of skim it to get by. This, at least in my opinion, is something that is really, really paramount to human health and safety. Okay, so as the video, talked about, or showed actually, fatigue failures always begin at a crack. And it may be a crack that has been present since manufacturing or developed over time due to cyclic straining around stress concentrations. And that's what was happening in the fuselage with the, the rivets causing little stress concentrations. Each flight to the pressurized cabin was just causing those little micro cracks to grow and grow and grow. So there are three stages to failure, fatigue failure crack initiation, so when the, the crack first starts, crack propagation, and then sudden fracture due to unstable crack growth. So this is why even ductal materials exhibit these catastrophic, really sudden failures. And this is also why we're always saying minimize stress concentrations, minimize stress concentrations, because even if you have a ductal material in static loading, stress concentrations aren't really aren't as big of a deal because you get that localized yielding and strain hardening. But with ductile materials and cyclic loading, fatigue loading, you can have a little micro crack and then over time your part will fail. So good design minimizes stress concentrations. So that's it for this first video. Thanks for watching. There will be more.